the reason the reason that I do what I do I love Jesus with all my heart I don't deserve to be saved, much less in ministry. I don't deserve to be a pastor, but I don't even deserve to be saved. It is all by grace through faith. And the day that you get over the awe of your salvation, you got a problem. And maybe one of the things that God brought you here to Saddleback this week is for you to go out and sit down under a tree and get reacquainted with your own salvation before you even think about your service. Because the first thing God wants you to do in life is not for you to love him. It's for him to love you. Let him love you. Love is always a response. What we're talking about is worship. Love is always a response. We love because he first loved us. And if you have a hard time with worship, it's because you've forgotten how much God loves you. When you understand that, you can't help but love him. People say to me, "Um, Pastor, my problem is I don't love God enough not your problem. Your problem is you don't know how much he loves you. Because if you did, you couldn't help but love him. You've forgotten. And you know it intellectually, but you don't feel it. And maybe what God brought you here to Saddleback is to feel the love of God again. Now in this session, we're starting to talk about worship. One of the five purposes. But there's a special place for worship. It's the number one purpose in life. It's the number one purpose of the church. It's the number one purpose in life. The guy comes to Jesus and says, Lord, what's the most important thing in the Bible? He says, real simple. I can summarize it for you. It's cliff notes in the Bible. Here it is. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Oh, by the way, love your neighbors yourself. It's all about love. Nothing's more important than learning to love God. What is worship? Worship is expressing my love to God. Whether you're in a one-on-one situation with him, or one in a group, or one with a thousand. It's expressing my love to God, and there are a thousand ways to express love to God. Now, in this session, if you'll turn to the third session called Attracting a Crowd to Worship, and I realize that for some of you, this is going to be a hard time, because even the phrase attracting is, well, are we supposed to really attract anybody? Aren't we really supposed to go, not come? And uh, I want to first say that worship in a purpose-driven church has nothing to do with your style. Uh, There are a thousand appropriate styles to God because style says more about your personality and your background than it does about any theology. There is no style of worship that's holy. It's only in spirit and in truth. But, um, I mean, today we have here, we have uh, uh, liturgical churches that worship liturgically, whether you're Catholic or you're Anglican or any of the other liturgical churches, we have Pentecostal churches, we have free churches, we have everybody in between and all kinds of different styles of worship. And you know what? I don't think God cares two bits the style you use as long as it's done in spirit and in truth. And again, if you had been born in Japan, you'd like a certain tone. And if you were born in the Middle East, you'd like a different tone. And, and if you were born on a different block of LA, you'd like a different kind of style. Uh, and so that really has nothing to do with it. But in this session, we're going to talk about moving through the circles. Now, the first circle we talked about was the community, and we do evangelism in the community. And then we want to move them from the community into the crowd. That means we want to bring them in to worship. Now, what about this phrase, crowd, here? Uh, Our goal in planning worship services that win unbelievers, a worship service can be a witness. Worship is the most powerful form of witness. 
People come to Christ far more when they're in, a, in an environment of a group than they are in a one-on-one. -on -one. Because if somebody's out there and I'm talking to them in a restaurant, it's just my opinion. But when they walk into a service like this and then everybody else is worshiping, go, whoa, some, they couldn't all be idiots. You know? <laughs> Somebody's got to be smart in here. And, and this many people, worship is a powerful witness. So what we want to talk about is how can you use use uh, uh, worship to bring people from the community into what we're calling the crowd, which is your week at service. Now, our goal in planning worship service is to win unbelievers to Christ, which is the same as John 7:31 there on the outline. Many in the crowd put their faith in him. And that's our goal every weekend, that many in the crowd will put their faith in him. Now, I want to begin with five observations about the crowd, and I just wrote them down there for you. First, Jesus' ministry attracted enormous crowds. One of the most obvious characteristics of his ministry is he had these large crowds. They were so big, they were called multitudes. Jesus did not just have a few people, 12 guys, following him. It says multitudes followed him. That's, he had a crowd ministry, and, uh, and they were big. And what am I saying about that? I'm saying that his, his, his ministry had a magnetic quality to it, uh, and unbelievers were attracted, and they thronged wherever Jesus went. Now, I believe that a Christ-like ministry still attracts people. Even in a counterculture or a culture that is opposing to Christ in many ways. It's still attractive when it's, when it's presented like Christ. Now, you don't have to use gimmicks to attract a crowd. You don't have to compromise your convictions to, to uh, bring a, get a crowd. You don't have to water down your message to attract a crowd. You don't have to have a church building to attract a crowd. We grew to over 10,000 without a building. We went 15 years before we built this building and we were running over 10,000 people every week, never had a building for 15 years. Um, but you do have to minister to people the way Jesus did. Jesus is an attract. He said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So what is it that attracted those large crowds? I want to know whatever Jesus did because I want to do what Jesus did. Because that attracts crowds. Jesus did three things. You might write these down if they're not written down there for you. Uh, number one, he met their needs. He met their needs. The Bible says in uh, Matthew 4, 25, Living Bible, enormous crowds followed him wherever he went. One time, he, the crowd was so huge, he was almost crushed by it. Another time, it said he fed 5,000, but if you look at it, it says 5,000 men. Wherever you have 5,000 men, how many women and children do you have? 10,000. Feeding of the 5,000 was probably more like the feeding of the 15,000. Because it, that, that's the size of crowd that was following Jesus, that magnetic, attractive quality. He met their needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, whatever, they needed bread, that's what he met. Number two, he loved them. Love always attracts, we're gonna talk about that uh, later in another session, but Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. What do you have when you see the crowd? Oh brother, headache, <laughs> parking, where are we going to put them? When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. A lot of people, when they see a crowd, they see a burden. A lot of people, when they see a crowd, they see a problem. They see stress. Do people know that you love them? Does the crowd at your church, whether it's 75 or 120 or whatever it is, does that crowd know that you really genuinely love them? I tell that to our people almost every single week when I stand up. How often do you tell them? He, he, he met their needs, he loved them, and the third thing is he taught them in an interesting and practical way. Jesus taught in an interesting and practical way. We've got a whole seminar on that, on the preaching seminar, but in Matthew 12, 37, the large crowd listened to him with delight. Circle that last word. They listened to him with delight. I believe those same three things will attract people in any culture, meet their needs, love them, and be interesting. It's not rocket science. Just do what Jesus did. Meet their needs, love them, and be interesting. 
the way some of us teach the Bible sometimes, we, see, the problem is if I'm boring in a message, people don't think I'm boring. They think God's boring. It looks bad. How do you take the greatest book in the world and bore people to tears with it? I don't know. But we're pretty good at it. Okay. So that's Jesus' ministry attracted crowds. The second thing I've learned is that, and I, it was said earlier, uh, I think Tim said it, or, or Carrie said it, a crowd is not a church. This is one of the mantras of Saddleback Church. A crowd is not a church. Now you can turn a crowd into a church, and you gotta get a big crowd to get a big church, but a crowd is not a church. A crowd can become a church if you have a strategy to move them from come and see to come and die, if you have a purpose-driven strategy. But a crowd is not a church. And so the people that show up on Sunday morning, we don't consider that our church, we consider that a crowd. Because there are all kinds of people in that group. Number three, no church can grow without attracting visitors, duh. So if you're gonna grow, you've gotta figure out a way to attract visitors. Now, there's been in the last 10 years, a lot of books, quote, missional books, that's saying uh, attractional evangelism is either out of date or it's irrelevant or it's not biblical, that it should be, uh, um, you know, not, the Bible doesn't say uh, come to church, the Bible says uh, go to the, to the members. Well, that's half true. Because the truth is Jesus taught both. He taught both come and see and go and tell. To non-believers, he says come. To believers, he says go. So attraction is a biblical concept. Go study how many times Jesus used the word come. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's called felt need evangelism. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and, and you'll have rest unto your soul. That's a felt need message. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest, not more stress. I'll give you rest. So study how many times, let the little children come to me. Attraction evangelism is clearly taught all through the New Testament. Any book that says it should only be about us going is wrong. It's just wrong. To non-believers he says come and to the church he says go. And that's the two whoop and wharf of, of evangelism. Go and tell. Now I mentioned this phrase now several times, so I better go ahead and explain it to you. Come and see to come and die. Everything we do at Saddleback is built on the model of Jesus Christ as far as we can possibly follow it. I have spent now the better part of four decades studying the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, over and over, looking not simply for what Jesus taught, but how he taught it and what he did and how he did it because he says, I didn't just show you what to say, I, I'm gonna tell you how to say it. Jesus started his ministry by going out and being baptized by John in uh, the Jordan River. River. Spirit comes down, uh, it's the inauguration of his ministry, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The very next day, most people miss this part, the very next day, Jesus went back out to the Jordan River where he had been baptized by John the day before. And as he's walking by John the Baptist who's baptizing in the Jordan River, John looks up and says to two of his disciples, John's disciples, Andrew and John, there goes the Lamb of God, follow him. Andrew and John asked Jesus the first question, public question of his ministry, and it's this, real simple. Where are you going, Lord? Jesus, these are the first words of Jesus' ministry. They said, where are you going, Lord? First words, public words of Jesus' ministry were these, come and see, come and see. That should be the first words of your ministry. Come and see. Just check us out. You can sit in the bleachers if you want to. You don't have to say anything, sign anything, sacrifice anything. Just come and see. That's about as low a commitment as you can get. Come and see. There's no commitment required to come and see. But it's the first words of Jesus. He didn't say take up your cross. He just says come and see. Check me out. You always start with come and see, come and see. That's how Jesus started. Now, he didn't leave them there. And so while he starts with no commitment, he's going to move them over the next three and a half years to total commitment. I have spent my life studying this. 
moving them from come and see to come and die. And over the next three and a half years, Jesus slowly starts turning up the heat. When he says, come and see, there's nothing required of me except to just chuck him out. But after a while, Jesus turns around and he says, and about 14 times in scripture, he redefines what it means to be a disciple. And at one point he turns around and says, you know, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to love each other. Ooh, he just turned up the heat. Now there's a requirement. I, I got to love each other. And, and then another time he goes, you know, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple. And you'll know the truth and the truth will, be, will set you free. Now he's just turned it up again. You got to continue in my word to be my disciple. I got to love each other and I got to, I got to continue in his word. Another time he goes, you know, if you want to, if you want to be my disciple, you got to love me more than your mother and father. Oh, now we're really turning up the heat. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Okay. And, and then at one point when he re redefines, this is not at the start. You always have to love people before you tell them the truth. Trust comes before truth. You don't get the right to tell them the truth until they trust you. And they trust you when you love them. Jesus proved that he loved them, and now he's turning up the heat. And at one point, he turns around in this three and a half years, and he goes, okay, guys, if you're going to follow me, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh, <laughs> what in the world does that mean? We're really not in Kansas anymore now. Eat my flesh and drink my blood? They had no idea what Jesus is talking about. And the Bible says the words were so strong that... Um, it said a lot of the crowd, that multitude, turned away because it was too hard for them. We don't, we, don't, we don't know what it means. And Jesus turns around and goes to Peter and the guys, uh, you guys going to leave me too? And they go, where are, you gonna, where are we going to go, Lord? You got the words of life. We don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. But you're stuck with us. Because we don't, there's no other place to go. You got the words of life. And we have no idea what you mean by eat my flesh and drink my blood. But we're with you. Now, he, would you agree there's a big difference in the level of commitment between come and see and eat my flesh and drink my blood? <laughs> We're, we have really ratcheted up the commitment. This is moving people through the circles. The circles from crowd to community to congregation, you know, to committed, to core, to commission, is turning up the heat in simply a visual way. It's doing what Jesus did. Now, finally, when he gets toward the cross... Jesus does turn around and say to his uh, followers, he said, guys, and of course there were many women there. When I say guys, it means California guys, men and women. Um, <laughs> I mean, we know the disciples could not have possibly followed Jesus without women because they're unorganized. They don't know how to cook for themselves. They're just, there's all kinds of problems. But and we, the Bible tells us there was a large number of women who were disciples, too, following Christ at the same time. But uh, Jesus turns around and goes, uh, okay, if you want to follow me, you got to take up your cross, and you got to deny yourself, and you got to follow me. Now, we don't even understand the full implication of that, like a wrecking ball when they hear it. Because for us today, the cross is a symbol of your hope. Take up your cross. We wear a cross around our neck. We put a cross on a steeple. We put a cross on hospitals. We put a cross in graveyards. It's a symbol of hope 2,000 years later. But in those days, nobody took up the cross unless the Romans were going to nail them to it. It meant come and die. It meant a die, a terrible death, a shameful death, a criminal's death, a torturous death. Come and die. Now, friends... The whole business of the church, the whole business of the church is moving people from come and see to come and die. And you move them through stages, systematic, sequentially. Now, here's the problem. Most churches tend to go to one of other extreme. Today, we got a lot of come and see churches. And it's come and see, come and see, come and see. And they got a big crowd, but they got no church. Because when any time I hear somebody say, it's all about the weekend. No, you're wrong. It's not. It's all about what happens during the week. The weekend's simply a funnel. It's a funnel to discipleship and the ministry and the mission. But it is not an end in itself. A crowd is not a church. 
And so we got a lot of churches that are big, but they're about that deep. They, they don't have any Bible. They're not memorizing any scripture. They're, they're, they don't have quiet times. They're not in groups. They're not serving. They're not sharing. It's just come and see. On the other hand, we've got the come and die churches, which are a little group that are the frozen chosen hunker in a bunker, and we are so proud of our discipleship. But nobody's coming to Christ. And, and the rest of the world around us is going to hell. Okay. The church that doesn't want to grow is saying to the world, you can go to hell. It takes unselfish people to grow a church. And some people are so interested in their own discipleship, they don't care about their lost neighbor. They haven't had a barbecue with them. So that we're moving them from here to here. Now, to do that, we move them from the community to the crowd, or we move them from no, no connection to our church into a worship service. Now, we're going to teach you today and in the next session tomorrow morning very, very nitty-gritty practical steps on how to build a service that is actually attractive to non-believers, uh, that causes you to reach the kind of people that, that Saddled Hack has, has reached, the numbers of people. Um, but before you do that, I want to teach you the why. Why always determines how long. Why is always more important than how. So before we teach you how to attract a crowd to worship, you need to understand the theological and the biblical reasons why we do everything we do. We have a biblical reason for everything we do in this church. And many, many years ago, I sat down and I wrote down 12 convictions about worship that I want, uh, I'm going to ask Tommy Colonan in just a minute to come out here and share the first ones, then I'll come back and share some of the others. Uh, Tommy Colonan has uh, been at Crossroads Church in Tampa for 20 years. Otherwise, you may have not known him as that name. You might know him by Urban D because he's a, he's a rapper. He's got four books out. He's done, he has a conference called Flavor Fest. 5,000 pastors have gone through that. Uh, he's had a network of 100 urban inner city pastors who've worked in, in uh, coaching. He's an amazing guy. And the reason I asked T uh, Tommy to share is because he's a hip-hop church and a total different style of uh, 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 music and worship than Saddleback is because it has nothing to do with style. So give a warm welcome to Urban D. All right, Tommy Colonna. Love you, bud. Yeah. All right. It's good to be back. You guys ready to have some fun this afternoon? I mean, this is the afternoon session. You guys just had some lunch, so we got to keep you guys awake. How many guys believe that pastors and church leaders can have fun? Come on, come on. Yeah, not, not, not all believe that way, right? Uh, but I believe the purpose-driven family, there, there's some fun people here. There, as a matter of fact, there's some characters. And you know who's also a character? Pastor Rick. He's a character. So let me tell you a true story about him, okay? Is that cool? So hashtag true story. This was, this was about 10 years ago. Uh, I was here at, in Orange County. We were having a pastor's meeting with Pastor Rick. A couple of us went out to dinner with him that night. And so after we went to dinner, this was here locally. Um, we were walking out to the cars, it was me and another guy who was on staff here named Dave Holden. Pastor Rick looked over and right behind the restaurant was Goodwill. And he said, hey, you guys want to go to Goodwill? And so when Pastor Rick asked you to go to Goodwill, you say, sure. <laughs> so we went to Goodwill with Pastor Rick and we're looking around, you know, Goodwill has all kinds of odds and ends. It's people's junk that becomes other people's treasure, right? And so what did we find there in the book section? A whole stack of purpose-driven life books. <laughs> and so he quickly was like, well, you know, Saddleback, we give them out to all the first-time guests, so I guess some of them end up here. Right? So he's like, I'm going to buy one. And so we're just all like cracking up, right? So he's walking up to the register with a purpose-driven life book, walks up to the, the young guy at the register, is like, hey, is this, do you know if this book is any good? The guy behind the register is like, I don't know, I never read it, but we sure get a lot of them here. So he goes ahead and he buys it, and then he says, hey, what's your name? And the young guy behind the register says, uh, my, my name's Mike. He said, you have a pen, Mike? And he says, yeah. He gives him a pen, puts the book there on the counter, starts signing it out. Mike, you know, signs his name. He's like, here, man, you, sh you should read this. I, I think it'll really help you. And he just walked out. We all walked out. <laughs> so give it up for Pastor Rick. He's, he's awesome. He's He's a fun guy. 
So we're going to get into 12 convictions real quick. And uh, 12 convictions about the why, about what you do before you get to the how. And it's good that we remind ourselves uh, and our people how the why, the why is so important. We get caught up in the how, but the why is about the conviction. So here's the first one. Only believers can truly worship God. Only believers can truly worship God. John 4.24 says, God is spirit, and only by the power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. So worship is from believers to God. And God, not man, is the focus of our worship. Here's a simple definition of worship. It's expressing our love to God for who he is and what he said and what he's doing. Now, unbelievers, they, they simply can't do this. Not yet. We want to get them there, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. So here's the second one. You don't need a building to worship God. Acts 17.24 says the God who made the world and everything in it um, is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. So buildings are great, right? But they're simply a tool. But as leaders, many times we can get caught up and think, if I don't have that tool, I can't do legit church. Well, until I get that, I, I really can't make it happen like I've seen it done at other places. And I know when we come to places like Saddleback, this is an amazing campus. And we look around, you guys see the kids' ministry spaces. I mean, you see the big patio out there where everybody can kind of fellowship. You, you look at these LED walls and you're like, oh, man, we can get a little bit of what you might call church lust. <laughs> you're like, oh, man, look at, look at that screen. I, I want one of those, right? And we can get caught up in that. But listen, Saddleback didn't have all the bells and whistles. Like you've heard this story, um, the first 15 years, they didn't even have their own building. And they grew to over 10,000 people. And they, and they met in over 70 different locations. What I want to understand is how did they let everybody know about that? that? Because that was before they had social media or email. Did they send everybody a fax? Or like <laughs> did they send up smoke signals or something? I don't know. But, but the point is, guys, they did all that without having a building. So you don't need to have every tool that you think you might need. A little bit about my story, uh, the church I've been leading in Tampa, Florida, Crossover Church, started there as the youth pastor, got pushed into being the lead pastor. That's how I discovered Purpose Driven because I said, man, I, I want our church to reach unchurched people. Like, who's doing that? I discovered Purpose Driven, discovered the material, and we started to shape our church around the five purposes. And so what happened? We immediately began to grow. We started reaching unchurched people. We had this little building that sat 200 people, and soon we had to start a second service, and a third service, and then we had an overflow room that was overflowing, and, and we were kind of stuck for a little while and, and dreaming about having a bigger space to reach more people and touch the city. And Pastor Rick always says, like, like, it's not bad to be a small church, but don't have a small vision. And so our vision was big because we started hanging around with people that had big visions. And so finally we got to the point where we were going to sell our building, and another church came along, and we went from being a permanent location to a portable location. And a lot of people told me, man, that's crazy. You're going to lose people because we weren't ready to get into the next permanent building yet. And so we sold our building and we moved to a hotel and we just started doing setup and breakdown. But the hotel, we met in these ballrooms and it was almost three times the size as what our former space was. And so guess what happened while we were at the hotel? We grew. We grew because we had more space. It wasn't about a building. We were now meeting in a hotel, and we had to set up and break down, and we were reaching more people for Jesus. And then uh, a little bit after that, we moved into a former retail box, uh, a great toy store that went out of business. <laughs> moved into a Toys R Us store, and I heard they're on the, they're on the comeback. They, they might make a comeback. I don't know. Watch out. Uh, so it doesn't matter. doesn't matter what, where you meet at. Here, here's, what, here's what matters. Here's what matters. Number three. It's there is no correct style of worship. It's only a correct spirit. Got to have that correct spirit. And Pastor Rick talked a little bit about how our church is different. But if you look around this room, I love the Purpose Driven family because it's diverse. Look around the room for a minute, y'all. This is beautiful. Look at the people that are sitting in your row, in front of you, behind you. You know what this is? This is a glimpse of heaven. You got people here from all over. Yeah, give it up for yourselves. This is beautiful. I'm not trying to down other conferences, but this doesn't happen at every conference. This is beautiful. There, there's dozens of countries 
that are even represented here, people that have come from other countries. And so you have all this diversity, and this room represents all kinds of different styles, sounds, instruments, flavors. I mean, some people here are charismatic, some are quiet, some are modern, some are traditional. You got things that are all in between. I mean, it's, it's, this is beautiful here. A little bit about my church in Tampa. Um, we're multi-ethnic, we're multi-generational, multi-class, we're in the city, we're, we're urban. So our style of worship um, is very rhythmic. We do some hip-hop. We do. We do some R&B. We do some gospel. We do some EDM. We have a DJ on the stage in every service. Uh, we do some reggae sometimes. We even do some salsa, some Spanish music. If, if it's r rhythmic, I mean, we're like a big melting pot. It's this big eclectic mix of rhythmic music, but it's in spirit and in truth. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 5 and 6, it says there's a variety of services, but the same Lord. Uh, and there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who activates what? All of them. All of them, guys. So true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for anyone who will worship him in that way. And so there's only three requirements that God gives us for legitimate worship. And that's this. It's in spirit. It's in truth. And it's in an orderly manner. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 14. But beyond that, um, we have freedom in style. And that's one thing I love about Purpose Driven because I, when I first became part of this family, I was wondering, I don't know if they're going to accept me. I, I'm kind of like the hip-hop guy. I'm a little different than Orange County. And you know what? I got permission to be myself here. I got permission to say, man, reach that group of people. That's great what you're doing. I got people that encouraged me and prayed for me and cheered me on. And so guess what? God likes to do things differently. He loves variety. He's the one that started it, right? <laughs> he makes us all different. So here's the truth. Um, your worship style is probably more about your culture and your background than it is your theology. It is. It is. And people will debate about worship of, oh, man, this style is more godly. This is more biblical. But many times, you know what that boils down to? Preference. Boils down to just what your preferences are. Funny thing is, every church likes to believe its style is the most biblical. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I personally think that a DJ is, is the most biblical. <laughs> I do. It says in, um, didn't have a scripture for it, sorry. Truth is this. <laughs> couldn't come up with anything witty. I was trying. Uh, truth is, there isn't a biblical style of worship, guys, because we all don't have the same instruments. You may not have a DJ. We may not have a guitar. But it's all good if you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. You're making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Um, it's awesome, right? Give it up for the Lord if you believe that. Come on, guys. Yeah. So here's the fourth conviction today. Fourth conviction is this. Unbelievers, they can watch. They can watch believers worship. Acts 2.47, it says, as they praised God, people in general, they liked what they saw. And as a result, every day their number, it grew. And God added to those that were being saved. And so if an unbeliever comes into your church, into a worship experience, and they see the joy that people have, if they can see some passionate worshipers worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and the Holy Spirit is present and God is moving, guess what can happen in that moment, guys? Miracles. Miracles can begin to happen. God can begin to move as people are just watching other people worship. And not just maybe during the singing part of the service, but Maybe even during the part where people are taking notes. People are shaking their head. People are agreeing as they're hearing the Bible being taught and it's answering questions that they have. And it's making sense and, you know, and they're noticing how worship, it encourages and it strengthens believers that are there. And it's changing believers. And they begin to see that. You know what they say? Man, I want some of that. Because you know what everybody wants? They want hope. They want hope. Here's the fifth conviction. Worship is a powerful witness to unbelievers if, circle if, circle if, if God's presence is felt and the message is understandable. Those are two key things. It's, it's a powerful witness if, to unbelievers, if God's presence is felt and the message is understandable. So in Acts chapter 2, God's presence was so evident there as they were in the city and they were worshiping God. It attracted the attention of unbelievers. And people came from all over the place. Thousands of people gathered. And here's why. 
So I, I've been pastoring a church in the city, and I grew up in the Philadelphia area. So I grew up around an urban environment my whole life. And here's the thing about people in the city, guys. They're nosy. <laughs> they are. If they see a crowd of people, they want to go over there and see what's going on. They get what we call FOMO, fear of missing out. What's going on over there? <laughs> what are those people doing? And they might take their phone out, you know, put it on Instagram, you know, put, do a Facebook Live. You know, man, I'm going to get some likes on this. Let me, let me see what's going on, right? So, but here's the thing. Even if you're not in the city, if you're in the suburbs, if you're in a small town, people are alike. Man, people are nosy. People are nosy. They want to see what's going on. They want to see what is happening in the crowd. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 6, you know, we know it was a big crowd because 3,000 people that day were saved. It says they believed and they were baptized. Now for me, immediately I start thinking like, what? 3,000 people got baptized spontaneously? Man, what did that look like? Did they have enough t-shirts? <laughs> like, I I'm wondering how many times did they have to change the water in the tanks? Because you know it starts getting a little funky after a little, bit of, a little while, you know. And then, like, what did the bathrooms look like after that? They must have been, like, destroyed. And how long did that take? They must have been there, like, all night, right? I, I believe that in heaven someday they're going to have, like, on-demand streaming of, like, biblical moments. We're going to be able to, I want to watch that one. I want to see that baptism and, and how, how that went down. Um, so, so why were 3,000 people that day saved and then baptized? Because they felt God's presence and they understood the message, Right? And I believe both elements there, they're super important. They're essential for worship to be a witness. Now, first of all, God's presence, it must be sensed. But every pastor knows this. Most people are one to Christ by feeling God's presence more than just our arguments. People are about feelings. If you've noticed like songs in the past year or two, like some of the top pop songs that are out there, hip-hop, R&B, that's pop music if you didn't know. Um, so much of it is about feelings. Everybody's all caught up in their feelings. You know, they want to get what they call the feels. Ooh, that service gave me the feels, right? They, they want to feel something. So do they, do they feel something? You know, when they step, step into the, it's God's presence in the building. Um, Pastor Rick said this. Actually, I said it, so I, I, thought, I thought about this. I thought this, and he said this. He said, uh, this was me, I, I said this. Um, in genuine worship... God's presence is, is felt, God's pardon is offered, God's purposes, they are revealed, and God's power is displayed. Wow, that's a great quote that I came up with. It's powerful. So before we get to number six, though, I know it's after lunch, and so I want to keep you guys awake, and I, I want to set this up with, uh, with a little spoken word piece. Is that cool? Is that cool? All right, so... So, all right, Mr. DJ, you know they got a DJ here now. Go ahead and drop that track. Anybody recognize that music? So, if you're under 30, you can Google Mr. Rogers. This is called Will You Be My Neighbor? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Will you be my neighbor? But wait, there's some conditions. See, you need to line up with my neighbor rendition. You need to line up with my position on the border wall, immigration, and prison reform. See, neighbor, you don't have to look like me, but you have to assimilate and conform to what I think is the norm. And if not, then I'll block you. I'll drop you. Matter of fact, behind your back, you could be sure that I'll mock you. But if you do line up with my ideas, well, great. But wait, I need to check your papers, your credit score. And by the way, are you straight? Because honestly, I hate people that are different than me. Honestly, I don't even talk to half the people in my family tree. Because they don't know how to be a good neighbor like me. <laughs> yeah. See, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that operate like that. They say, yeah, will you be my neighbor? I want to love you. Oh, but wait a minute. Oh, you don't believe the same way I do? You don't, have the, you don't vote the way I do? You don't value the same things? Oh, uh, well, I don't know if you can be my neighbor. But how are we really supposed to act? Here's part two. 
So what did Jesus mean when he said to love your neighbor as you love yourself? So many people don't know because their Bible's collecting dust up on the shelf. Luke chapter 10, Jesus was asked a question. Who is my neighbor? There was a powerful lesson. His culture like ours was full of discrimination. People chose their neighbor by process of elimination. And he told this story about this Samaritan that was despised. Two religious leaders walked by and basically compromised. But Jesus revised this Samaritan's title to good because he stopped and helped this beat up Jew like a true neighbor would. Even though their people had beef, and if that Jew wouldn't have been hurt, he might have given that Samaritan some grief. So what can we learn? No matter our neighbor's politics, lifestyle, or skin color, we can show the love of Christ as a sister or a brother. Yeah. So turn to the person next to you and ask them, will you be my neighbor? Will you be my neighbor? All right. Okay, so bring it back. ADD in the building. Come on, bring it back. Okay. Shh. We got to keep it moving. Number six, write this down. That sets it up. God expects us to be sensitive. Everybody say sensitive. sensitive. To the fears, hang-ups, and needs of unbelievers when they are present in our worship services. Because our neighbors, when they come in, if we say we love them, we want them to be there, they've got some fears, some hang-ups, and some needs. And so Paul told this to the Corinthian church. He said, be wise in the way that you act towards those that are not believers, making good use of what kind of opportunity? Everyone. Uh, when they are with you, your speech should always be pleasant and interesting. Also said, be tactful with those who are not Christians. So when, think about it for a minute. When you have guests over to your house for dinner, you're probably going to act differently, right? Because you want to love on those guests and put their needs first. And so, so what are some things you may do when you have guests coming over? I mean special guests, not your BFF. Uh, you're probably going to clean the house, right, ladies? Fellas, you're going to probably have to cut the grass, take the trash out, right? And, and then you also want to cook something really good, right? You want to cook your best dish. Do I got any chefs in the building? Anybody can cook here? Raise your hand if you can cook. If you, if you like, pastors can't cook much, huh? What's going on? We like to go out to eat, right? Okay, so a few hands went up, right? So if you're here and you can cook, if you can throw down in the kitchen, on the count of three, I just want you to yell out, what, what is your best dish that you can cook up? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay. There you go. So imagine if everything that was just yelled out in this incredibly diverse crowd, imagine if that was a buffet. That's going to be the buffet in heaven, I believe, someday, right? We're going to all be eating up there, right? So, so my wife, shout out to my wife, Lucy. She's in the building. Give it up for my wife, Lucy. She's a great cook. She could cook, man. She'll make some arroz con pollo. You know, that's rice and chicken, you know, with the red beans, Puerto Rican style. I mean, like, we're ready to throw down. Woo! Oh, yeah. So then, then you know, then, then we have to sit down. We have to have that talk. With our, with our daughters, they're 13 and 16, they're teenagers, we have to tell them, you know, don't burp at the table, you know, no, no, no phones at the table, put your device away, you know, be nice, talk to people, make eye contact, you know, um, you know, be polite. Now listen, is that being hypocritical? No, no, it's called being polite. You're showing respect to your guests. So, you know, every single weekend we're hoping, we're praying that God will send guests to our house, aren't we? We're like, God, we're praying for our neighbors, for people in our city. Like, God, draw them in. As we invite people, as our people go out and build relationships with people, as we might do some kind of special campaign or outreach or an event, we're inviting them into our worship experience. So my question is, are you guys ready for them? Are you ready? So the classic chapter on being sensitive to the needs of unbelievers is 1 Corinthians 14. And we get this principle of sensitivity uh, where Paul talks about it. Chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 23, he says this. He said, if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind, that you're crazy? 
loco, like, like man. Like. Now listen, Paul commanded, he's saying that, that tongues need to be limited in a public worship experience. His reasoning was it might look a little crazy to some outsiders. He's not saying it's crazy, but he's saying if you gather in a public setting, you're inviting the public to come in. If somebody speaks in tongues, then somebody else needs to interpret it so it's understandable. We want things to be understandable. We don't want that to be a barrier. The point that Paul is making is we have to be willing to adjust. Somebody say adjust. Adjust our worship practices when unbelievers are present. So being sensitive to them, you know what, it's, it's a biblical command. It's not a marketing tip, but it's a biblical command right here. And although Paul maybe never used that actual word sensitivity uh, to the unbeliever in worship, I mean, he definitely pioneered the idea. He's, he's an OG in it. And so speaking of a pioneer and an OG, I'm going to get Pastor Rick. He's going to come back out. He's going to keep it moving. So give it up for Pastor Rick. Come on. Thanks, buddy. Great. All right. Now, I, I want to just reinforce what Tommy just said. That passage, a classic passage on tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is not saying that tongues are foolish because they're not. But he says they might appear foolish to an unbeliever. And what the point he makes is we have to adjust, be willing to adjust our worship practices when an unbeliever is present. That's all he's saying. We have to be sensitive. The principle of being sensitive to an unbeliever is not some modern marketing thing. It's 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 says when an unbeliever is present in your worship, you adjust your worship. That's just being kind. That's just being nice. Now, let me tell you, that doesn't mean, for those of you who are charismatic churches, doesn't mean you don't have to uh, you know, experience all the gifts. Let me tell you how to do it. Here's how, how you do this, to be sensitive and still administer all the, the gifts. When I go to an opera, I'm not expecting it to be in English. Now, let me just first say, I hate opera. Okay, okay, okay. Because I don't know, but, but, you know, some people, I mean, I don't think really any man likes opera. But... Uh, <laughs> That's a whole nother issue. Uh, but anyway, when I go to an opera uh, and they're singing in Italian or Latin or, or something, um, I don't have the foggiest idea what they're talking about. But the good thing I do like about opera is they give me a little cheat sheet manual. And when I open it up, they go, this is what's going on right now. And this is what they're saying. And I go, okay. I'm not asking them to sing the Living Bible Version opera in English. They're singing it in Italian. It should be sung in Italian. It's an Italian opera. It would be really weird if, you know, sung it in my language. And so, but by giving me a little program guide, they go, here's the storyline. And they go, oh, I, I can kind of put it together. I see, I see she's crying right now while she's singing. And that's what I'm reading this. And I'm reading that. So I'm saying... Whatever your practices are, whether you are charismatic or Pentecostal or liturgical or anything else, just use your program to explain what you're doing. So like, if you kneel, here's why we kneel. And, and if you raise your hands, here's why we raise our hands. And if somebody falls over, here's why they fall over. <laughs> okay, okay. And, 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 you know, what's the priest doing, you know, with this? Here? Explain it. Just give me litur liturgy 101. See, I'm telling you, you don't have to change your worship style. Does this make sense? You don't have to change your, you just have to explain it. Because when people come to church, they expect it to be church. But they need to be understandable. And that leads me to this number seventh conviction, is that the worship service does not have to be shallow to be evangelistic. But the message doesn't have to be compromised, just understandable. Just understandable. 1 Corinthians 14, 11, if I don't understand the language, it's not going to do me much good. Now, the mir this was the whole miracle, of course, of Pentecost. The miracle of understandable message is what brought 3,000 people to Christ on, uh, on Pentecost Sunday. Because Acts 2, 8 says, how is it that each of us hears and understands in our own native language? The, the, the miracle wasn't necessarily the tongues. The miracle was the fact that everybody understood it. And everybody who understood their word was actually hearing it. 
So making a service, com quote, comfortable me uh, for, for a visitor doesn't mean changing your theology. It just means being nice to people, okay? Being, being friendly, being hospitable. Now, the message, when you share it on a weekend, is not always comfortable. I share a lot of messages that are not comfortable. Uh, sometimes the message of the word of the truth is very uncomfortable because uh, we have to teach the whole counsel of God. And I really don't think non-believers are asking for a watered-down message, but they are asking to hear it in a way that they go, oh, I got that, that makes sense. Give me an illustration. Give me an analogy. Give me a metaphor. So I'm saying that being sensitive to unbelievers in your service is not going to change what you say, but it will change how you say it. I mean, even the hardest message, uh, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. How do you think Jesus would preach Romans 3.23? You think Jesus would stand and go, all have sinned. All of you have fallen short of the glory of God. I don't think so. I think he'd say it more like this. You know, you guys, all, everybody sinned. Everybody's come short of the glory of God. And everybody's going, yep, yep, yep. If you say it offensively, it will be received defensively. I said the exact same thing. It just was the tone of my voice. And actually, the harder, I wish I had time to teach you this in the preaching seminar, the harder the truth is, the more you lower your voice. Okay? The harder the truth is, the, you draw them in. You don't shout at people when you got a negative part. You, draw, you can say a negative, but you, you lower your voice. All right, number eight. The needs, another conviction. The needs of believers and unbelievers often overlap. They're different in some areas, but they're very similar in many areas. Psalm 40, verse 3, many people will, he put a new song in my mouth. Many people will see this and worship him, and then they will trust the Lord. That's called evangelistic worship right there. They'll see and worship him, then they will worship the Lord. Now, a lot of times we think, well, the needs of believers and needs of unbelievers are very different. Well, that's true in some areas. But both unbelievers and believers need to know what God is really like. Both believers and unbelievers need to know the purpose of life. Both believers and unbelievers uh, need to know how to deal with suffering and pain and grief. Both believers and unbelievers need to know how to strengthen their marriage and family. Both believers and unbelievers need to know why materialism is so destructive. It's the exact same need. You just got to say it in a way that's clear. Christians don't stop being human beings once they're saved. They still have human problems. Now, number nine, it's best to purposefully target your services according to their purposes. In other words, one to do one, one to do the other. But if, as your church grows bigger and bigger, you actually end up doing both. But here's the point. When we send mixed signals, we get mixed results. And, and the problem is, it's hard to aim at two targets at the same time, to edify the saved and evangelize the lost at the same time. Think about this. In the typical service, everything in the service is designed for the believer until the invitation at the close. And the guy goes, you already lost me. First you sang songs I didn't understand, to tunes I didn't know, to words that made no sense to me. And then you had a bunch of announcements I couldn't relate to. And then the message was for people who follow this faith, and then now you're asking me to come to Christ. It's like, you already lost me. 90% of the service is for, an unbelie for a believer, and then you're going to tack on a come to Christ at the end? You know, the problem with, with not targeting is that, well, I, I had this problem because my daddy was a pastor. Growing up from week to week, I never knew if it was a safe week to bring anybody to church. <laughs> okay. I mean, on the week I did not bring my friend, to, high school friend to church, my dad would preach on the cross and grace and salvation. And on the week I brought my friend from high school to church, my dad would preach on tithing. <laughs> Never could figure out if it's a safe week. The reason why your members don't bring people is they don't know if it's a safe week. Now, the way to get around that is to announce your series in advance, say, this next six weeks, you can bring anybody to this. Okay. And, you know, let people know. You know, even in evangelistic service, as I said, the first part's usually geared, geared, geared toward believers. Now, uh, number, uh, what's the next one? Nine, ten? Number ten. 
Um, a service that witnesses to unbelievers is meant to supplement personal evangelism, not replace it. In other words, you don't want to build a church where the only evangelism people do is bring people to, Christ, to church. Bringing is different than witnessing. And, and bringing is a good thing, but you need to teach people how to share their faith too. Uh, people often find it easier to decide for Christ when there are a lot of multiple people supporting that decision. And as I said, an unbeliever comes into a crowd, particularly the larger the crowd gets, they go, wow, this is impressive. Um, I, I really ought to listen to this. And there's incredible persuasive power when you've got a group of people. 50 people are more impressive than one or two. And 75 are more impressive than 10. And so that, that makes a good the larger your church grows, actually the greater potential it has to draw in unbelievers because they can hide in the crowd. Tomorrow we're going to talk about singing. And, you know, if you're in a church and you got 30 people and an unbeliever comes in and you're going to sing for 30 minutes, he's going to stand there just going, everybody knows I'm not singing. And we all know it because we could all see him. But in a church this size, he could stand there and nobody cares because he's not being singled out. No, number 11, different kinds of services reach different kinds of unbelievers, and that's because they're not all alike. I hate to belabor this point, but it's true. Some people need a high participation service to, to really engage their heart. Other people need a quiet, meditative service to engage their heart. Uh, some people want to sit passively and, and watch, and that draws them close to God, and other people need to run around the aisles. And, uh, you, you know, uh, it, I'm just, I'm not making fun of this. I'm just saying we're all wired differently. We're all wired differently. That's why we need all kinds of churches. Um, different kind of, of, of services, are, they're all fine. The only non-negotiable elements, really, in a service that's going to reach non-believers is you got to treat people with respect, okay? Uh, you got to treat them with love and respect. You got to somehow relate it to their needs, uh, share the message in a practical way, and, and all the other elements, the stuff we're going to share tomorrow, we're going to spend an entire session on different elements of a worship service. But they're all really secondary compared to what I just said. Love people, respect them, and, and speak in a way that they can understand. Now, let me tell you what. I'm trying to set you up because tomorrow we're going to overwhelm you with a fire hydrant of suggestions for your worship service. You know what's the most important thing? To reach people for Christ. You know what attracts them more than anything else? It's not the music. It's not the message. It's not the building. It's not even the love. It's changed lives. Changed lives attract unbelievers. And that's why I'm going to talk to you about the importance of having testimonies. We used to have a testimony in every service. I think we need to go back to it. It's a powerful, powerful tool. Most churches have testimonies, but the wrong people hear it. They hear it on Wednesday night at a prayer meeting or something, or in a small group. And I'm going, wait a minute, those testimonies are great. They need to be when you've got the most non-believers present. And for many years, at least 15 years, I put a testimony in the middle of my sermon. And I say, you know, rather than me, we never use drama. We very rarely use drama. Uh, I go, why would I use a fake story when I got a real one right here? And we just have a testimony come out and share. And it's a whole lot easier, cheaper than having, because, <laughs> it, it, and if you got, you know, if, if, you're, if your drama suck like camp scripts, you know, they just, don't, don't do it, please. It's better. What I'm saying is what really attracts people is changed lives. At Saddleback Church, the secret of this church is there are changed lives everywhere. And, uh. We have confounded the conventional wisdom. As I said, we went 15, 13 years without a uh, property, 15 years without a building, set up and took down a church of 10,000 people every single week for 10,000 people. Now, imagine a church where the location kept changing. We used 79 different facilities in the first 13 years of this church. We went 70, we moved 79, one time we moved the church nine miles. 79 different facilities. We said, we're the church where if you can figure out where we are this week, you get to come. Because <laughs> we only want really intelligent people. So 
if you can't find us, you're not smart enough. <laughs> but they would, they, would, they would go to 79 different facilities. They would sit in a freezing tent in the winter, a leaky tent in the rainy spring, blistering heat in the sun in the summer, and where people would park up to three miles away and walk through mud to get here. Why would they get here? Changed lives. Changed lives. And, 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 and you start promoting those changed lives. When lives are being changed, a lot of problems that you have in your church get solved real quick. You know, when you're busy rowing the boat, you don't have time to rock it. Because so many lives are being changed. Now, is there anything else I want to say? Oh, number 12. <laughs> it takes unselfish, mature believers to offer an evangelistic worship service. It takes unselfish, mature believers to offer an evangelistic worship service. Because the moment you start changing things in your worship service, somebody's going to get upset. Now, I, th- I don't know if Tommy said this earlier, but uh, I make the point that everybody said, well, you're just catering to culture. Let me tell you what. Every church in the world caters to some culture. Your church right now is catering to a particular culture. It may be a church culture. It may be a culture of the 1950s, but it's culture. If you want to know what culture your church has, change your music next week. (laughs) And you'll realize that you're you're meeting consumers' needs right there. And some consumers are going to get upset with you. Now, no matter what style of worship you choose, somebody's going to criticize it. Okay? So the wrong thing is what's get criticized. The right question is, what style will best reach who we're trying to reach? Who, who, who's in this community and what would reach them? It takes unselfish, mature people to, to build a worship service. In every church, there's this constant tension between what I call service and serve us. Everybody's happy for the church to grow until somebody sits in my seat. And there's always this tension between the newcomers and the old timers. And when the first co- we get newcomers coming in, with, hey, this is great. Look at help pay the bills. This is great. But w- the moment you have more newcomers than old timers, whose church is it? And then you've got the, 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 the tension between the pioneers and the homesteaders. We'll talk about that in the last session of uh, how to lead your church to change or how to not perish in the parish. 1 Corinthians 9, 12, Paul says we haven't used our rights. Instead, this is what kind of attitude we need to grow churches. We would put up with anything in order to not hinder the good news of Christ in any way. Do you have members of your church who are willing to put up with anything in order to start reaching people? As I said, a lot of times evangelistic churches are often accused of catering to consumers. But every traditional service caters to somebody. And the moment you change it, you'll know who that is. The only difference you need to ask is whose needs are going to be met. Selfish Christians or the people Christ died for who don't know him yet. Matthew 20, 28. Jesus said, your attitude must be like that of my own. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve. Can you imagine a missionary who goes to a country and said, I've got the greatest news in the world. Here's the only problem. You've got to learn my language first. And you've got to dress my way. And you've got to come to my house. And you've got to sing my songs. And you've got to like my tunes. We call that a strategy for failure. I think that's all I need to say on that one. Until this attitude of unselfishness permeates the hearts of your members... Um, your church isn't really ready to begin a service that will actually reach unbelievers. And so you're going to have to do some some spade work in the hearts of people. So the stuff we share tomorrow morning really is not ready to be shared with your people until they understand the why. And when they buy into the why, then they'll go with the how. All right, it's time to go to our labs.